Good morning and welcome to Grace Baptist Church. We're glad that you've chosen to join us this morning. Let's all stand together as we sing, To God be the glory, great things he hath done. stanza great things he had taught us great things he had taught and great our rejoicing through Jesus the Son our Lord and higher and greater will be our wonder our transport when Jesus we see praise the Lord As a church, we're memorizing together uh, Psalm 1. We're working our way through the psalm. We've memorized verses 1 through 3, and we just started verse 4 last week. And so uh, we'll say the reference, and then the verse will all be there for you. We'll say it, and we'll finish with the reference. Ready? Psalm 1, 4. The ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff which the wind driveth away. Psalm 1, 4. All right, and we'll have a few blanks to fill in this time through. Ready? We'll say the reference, then the psalm, and then the, refer the verse, then the reference. Ready? Psalm, psalm 1, 4. The ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff which the wind driveth away. Psalm 1, 4. I would do really well if it wasn't for the people behind me up here. <laughs> Hey, it's a short verse, but challenging, right? Okay. I hope that you're um, helping us uh, with that, and uh, you're helping yourself to memorize Psalm 1, and it's great to be able to memorize Scripture together as a church, and that, of course, is a great passage of Scripture to know as well, so um, keep on working at it. Um, we uh, do praise the Lord that uh, we are able to meet together. We're thankful for our online crowd as well. If you're joining us online through Facebook or through our website, um, we thank you for that. We pray that everything goes okay on a technological side of things uh, this morning and also live, all right? When we do it live here, um, all we got, you know, is we just got one chance to get it right, all right? So we hope that we do, but we want God to be honored and glorified and lifted up today. So continue to pray for one another, continue to pray for our country, continue to also um, witness and and uh, tell the world the news that Jesus loves them, give them the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's what our world needs so desperately today. And that's why, as a church, as we can assemble, um, we glorify our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ today for eternal life. And we also get uh, fired up, pumped up, and uh, we get, um, we get uh, 
uh, I would say, edified as well as we um, learn God's word and take it out into the highways and hedges about us. And so let's ask God to bless our time together here as we worship him. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for the ability that we have to come together today as your body, as your church. Lord, meeting here this on this corner for so many years, Lord, we thank you for our regular attenders. We thank you for our visitors today. We thank you for those that are visiting family today, I know, as well. And uh, Father, I pray that you would be honored and glorified today. May Jesus Christ, our Savior, be lifted up among us. And uh, Lord, it is him who we worship today. We're so thankful for the salvation that he gives to us through his shed blood on the cross. We thank you, Father, for the price that was paid for our salvation. And Lord, I do pray that if there's one here this morning that does not know you as their own personal Savior, I pray that today would be the day that they would understand what it truly means to repent of their sin and to ask you to forgive them and to cleanse them and that they might take Jesus Christ as their own Savior today and trust him by faith. Lord, I pray for those that have come in with burdens, those that have come in with various cares and, and concerns. Lord, I pray that you might work in their life today as well. May the word of God be sufficient to challenge us, to convict us, and to change our hearts, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. you may be seated. Folks, that's a choir, okay? Um, we did have them sing for God and Country Day, uh, but that is only the second time since March that our choir has sung, and they are back practicing once again, um, and they are going to get, be getting ready for our Red, White, and Blue Day coming up in a couple of weeks, as well as Living Christmas Tree 
if they don't try to cancel Christmas uh, this year, all right? And so let me just make a few announcements here. If you have your bulletin with you, there are some at the information desk if you did not get one. But um, as far as choir rehearsal goes, they are rehearsing at 445 here in the loft. And then, of course, tonight at 6 o'clock is our evening worship service. Uh, tonight is our annual school night. And uh, yes, we uh, highlight our Heritage Hall Christian School teachers. We have some new ones uh, to introduce to you tonight as well. You'll be hearing from them and who's teaching what and things. And uh, Mr. Stein will wrap up at the end there. But um, I hope that everybody will come and pray for our students this year. Folks, if there was ever a year that you needed to pray for our students, our young people, whether they be in elementary or um, high school or college age even, uh, it's this year. They need your prayers. They need you to uplift them and intercede on their behalf, that our teachers need you to intercede on their behalf. We don't know uh, what next week holds really, do we? And so I praise the Lord that we're able to open for school, and Friday, I believe, went relatively smoothly. Uh, Mr. Stein is no longer in fetal position under his desk, and uh, the teachers are mostly here today as well. So um, I, I went around and looked at all the classes and, and uh, said hi to the kids and things, and and. Uh, it, there were some interesting things that the, t that the kids say when, I, I just threw up trouble, let me just say that, okay? And the teachers have to get them back under control and things like that, but um, otherwise it looked like things went okay without me walking around, all right? So, but I hope you're here tonight for that. At the, uh, at the end of the service, we always come forward as families and pray together um, with uh, our students. And uh, even if you have grandkids going to school um, or something like that, we implore you, we want you to come tonight and be a part of that school night at 6 o'clock tonight. Uh, Tuesday, there are discipleship studies going on for both ladies and men at 6.30. Uh, this is the first week that we're off of our Super Summer Tuesdays, and so we will once again start having Wednesday evening prayer meeting. Wednesday will be our midweek prayer service and elective time. Uh, we will continue with Discipleship 2 on the Christian walk in here, and also um, there's a blurb in here uh, that Miss Mitchell will begin uh, her new study as well on, um, I guess that's next week. Women in the Word begins next week on Wednesday, August 19th, or maybe in a couple of weeks, I guess that is. So, uh, but we'll be in here for the next couple of weeks, and we'll begin those other studies as well. Grief Share also begins down in the elementary library. I think actually we're going to be in the fellowship hall, um, fellowship hall to kind of uh, space people out a little bit more than in the elementary library there. Uh, Thursday, there's some more Bible studies, college hangout, and of course, Friday is always recover, our recovery program for Forward Unanimous. Had some folks asking about that the other day, and um, always uh, let them know that Reformers Unanimous starts at 7 o'clock every Friday night in the Fellowship Hall. Be uh, glad to have anybody uh, that wants to come. I talked to Edna Grubbs back there. She has her grandchild back there with her today, and today would have been Jean's birthday. And so, uh, Edna, we're thinking about you, praying for you. Continue to, uh, continue to send her your encouragement, if you would, please. It's good to see her here today. All right, just a couple other things here that you can see in the bulletin. Uh, there's some different things coming up, Mommy and Me play groups and various things, Living Christmas Tree kickoff luncheons. Uh, Pastor Halleck may say something about that. Uh, but on Sunday, September 13th, is our 16th annual Red, White, and Blue Day honoring all of our communities active and fallen law enforcement, firefighters, and emergency services personnel. And so I hope that you'll be inviting folks that you know that fall into those categories to come with you on uh, Sunday, September 13th. We'll have our meal for them as well once again. And so it'll be a big day. Um, please do your part to invite folks that you know to come to that. And then also we've added one more thing here in the coming events. We do have our revival meeting with the Everson family uh, in the last week of September. So start praying about that now as well if you would. If you are visiting with us, and I know we have um, several visitors here today, some are family, uh, and we welcome you. I see the Armstrongs back there. I see uh, S Steve and Karen have their son here, and I know Dan Cochran and his family's here. Um, and I'm going to forget somebody here as I look around. Rachel's got her sister here, I think, and granddaughter. And then, uh, I don't know, we're looking around here. I know there's more people here than that. Um, We've got a couple of newly married couples here today as well, and uh, we welcome them into the service. Um, so thank you for being here today. But if uh, normally we uh, would have a handshaking time here at Grace Baptist Church and get to know you a little bit, but uh, we do have a QR code, uh, which is that box with the squiggly lines in it, um, in a bulletin. It'll take you to our website and uh, tell you a little bit more about the church. But right now we're not handing out uh, visitor packets or visitor cards at this time due to the pandemic. All right, Pastor Halleck, let's sing another song.
Great is thy faithfulness, O God, my Father. song. Most of you know that song, and most of you have been able to live that song. Amen? Seeing the Lord's faithfulness, they're new every day. Let's have the ushers come at this time. They're not going to pass the plates. Uh, they will bring them around, all right? But they'll be the only ones touching them, all right? So you don't have to worry about that here today. For those of you that are watching us online. We do have an online giving platform as well on our website. You can go there. It's very easy. Uh, drop down menus and things. You can give there as the Lord leads. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for your love. We thank you for your protection. We thank you, Lord, for your uh, guiding uh, hand over this church. And Lord, I pray that you might help us as we continue to serve you here. Lord, I pray that you might help us to uh, um, complete the task that you have given to this church, to this body, to accomplish for your will, for your glory, and your honor. And Lord, I pray that as we give our dimes and our dollars here today, Father, that you might bless each one. And Lord, that you might multiply it and use it for your honor and glory. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
Thank you, Emily. In the morning when I rise, you can have all this world. Give me Jesus. Let's all stand together and lift our voices as we sing, Praise my soul, the King of heaven. singing this morning, you may be seated. This time we'll have a special song by Pastor Mike Sewell. Son, only one spotless. 
first lamb could sacrifice. Only one power can save, only one empty grave, only one narrow way, Jesus Christ. One faith in Christ alone, one truth I'm resting on, one life he gave for all, Christ the Lord. One faith in Christ alone, one truth I'm resting on, one life he gave for all, Christ the Lord, the only way, only one left his throne, only one begotten Son, only one spotless Lamb could Thank you, Pastor Eddie. I appreciate that very much. What a powerful song. A lot of deep meaning there as well. Take your Bibles, please, and turn to Joshua chapter 7. Joshua chapter 7. Certain moments in history, we all remember where we were and what was going on at the time when that particular thing happened. I remember my father telling me about when... Um, President John F. Kennedy was assassinated um, there in, uh, I believe it was 1963, November of 63. Am I correct on that? Some of you remember where you were. Remember where you were when President Kennedy was assassinated? Okay, some of you are dating yourselves, but um, my dad says he was standing in line um, in the military to receive his clothing and things when it came out that President um, Kennedy had been assassinated. Maybe you remember where you were the moment the towers fell, the moment the, the towers were hit on 9-11, the Pentagon, on that day, November, uh, or I'm sorry, September 11th, 2001. Remember where you were on that? Remember where you were on that? I remember probably the, one of the first times, other than when Reagan was shot, I was alive when Reagan was shot um, as well. I was outside playing basketball with some friends. I was in elementary school uh, when Reagan was shot and it came over uh, the television that um, he had been shot that day. But I also remember sitting in class as a junior in high school, January of 1986, when the space shuttle Challenger exploded upon takeoff just about 90 some odd seconds into flight. I remember watching that. And I remember the rest of the day, they brought in televisions there into the Christian school where I was at, and, and they showed us the news coverage of what was going on. And I just remember feeling so sad for the families. I remember feeling so sad as the nation grieved, as the nation mourned. In the coming days, people were asking questions as far as how could this have happened? How could this have taken place? What was the problem that caused this mighty machine to explode in midair and take the lives that it did and really took the collective breath of the nation with it as well. And they came to believe that it was an O-ring. Remember that? An O-ring on the, on the rocket boosters on the side there. The Florida, um, the, the coast there had had some freezing weather, and they believed that the O-ring had expanded and contracted and expanded and contracted to a point where, if you remember that little bitty film that they had about the little 
flame coming out of the side of that booster rocket, and it ignited, and it blew up the entire Space Shuttle Challenger. Just an O-ring did that. You know, it's many times like that in our Christian life as well. And that's why I've entitled this message, It's the Little Things That Will Destroy You. It's the little things that will destroy you. It's the things that go unnoticed. It's the things that really matter. They may be very tiny. They may be very small. But they will end up destroying your life. They can destroy my life. They can destroy a church. It's the little things like that. Like the O-ring on the space shuttle Challenger. Here in Joshua chapter 7, you know the story. You know the account here of Achan and his sin. The Bible says that they had just gotten done coming into the land of Canaan. And they defeated the first major city there in Canaan. The Israelites did after they had wandered for 40 years in the wilderness because of their disobedience when they first came uh, to the land. And, and they said, hey, it's a great land, but there is no way we can go in here. They're, they're too strong for us. The cities are walled. They're high. And they're talking about Jericho here. Jericho was a mighty city. Jericho was a great walled city. And yet, when they came back at this point, 40 years later, all their parents and their grandparents and all the faithless people had passed off the scene, and now you've got a whole new generation of Israelites, and they're ready to take the land. And now even Moses has passed off the scene, and they've got their commander, Joshua. And God has told Joshua, be strong and of a good courage. Have I not commanded thee? Three different times in Joshua 1, God says, be strong and of a good courage. And Joshua passes off that uh, promise and that command to the people of Israel, and they have a plan to defeat the city of Jericho. And you remember the story, how they marched around it once, and they went home, and the next day they marched around it again. And they did that for six days. On the seventh day, they marched around Jericho seven times, and the Bible says what? The walls came tumbling down, right? The walls came tumbling down, and the people of Israel wrought a great victory that day through God and his powerful working in their lives. God said that he would fight for them. God said that he would help them when they would come into the land. And he indeed did on that day. And Jericho was vanquished. It was defeated. There was only one problem. God had told the people of Israel that when they went into Jericho, that everything that was there that they could have taken as the spoils of war or something like that was to be dedicated first off to God. It was the first fruits of the land that they were coming into. And God said all of the gold and everything precious was going to belong to him at that point. Everything else that they would gather from the land of Canaan as they would defeat city after city after city and go through the land and possess it, everything else was, be, was, was going to be theirs. But not Jericho. That was the rule. That was what God had commanded. And all the people obeyed that except for one guy. One infamous man named Achan. And that's where we pick up the account here in Joshua chapter 7. It says in verse 1, But the children of Israel committed a trespass in the accursed thing. For Achan, the son of Carmi, the son of Zabdi, the son of Zerah of the tribe of Judah took of the accursed thing, and the anger of the Lord was kindled against the children of Israel. Folks, why is it that it seems like there's always somebody that the rules don't apply to, right? They don't apply to me. They don't apply to you because we don't want to go along with that policy. We don't want to go along with that rule. You know as well as I do, there's always somebody at work. There's always somebody in the classroom, teachers, or maybe you're a student. Uh, there's always somebody at, at, at your house or wherever, okay, that the rules never apply to them. They never apply to them. Well, here's Achan. Out of all the soldiers, out of all the people that went into the city of Jericho, He's the only one we're told about that took of what the Bible calls the accursed thing. Took of the accursed thing. And Joshua sent men from Jericho. This is, this is behind the scenes information that we uh, know, but Joshua did not know at the time, verse 1 there. And Joshua goes ahead and he sends men to Ai, which is beside uh, Bethel. And he's speaking to them, saying, Go up and view the country. And the men went up and viewed Ai, and they returned to Joshua and said unto him, Let not all the people go up, 
But let about two or three thousand men go up and smite Ai, and make not all the people to labor thither, for they are but few. So, you know, here's mighty Jericho, and they needed everybody to help defeat Jericho, and then they go up to like Ai. It's like going up to Gaston or something, okay? Little, little Gaston, or, or maybe even maybe like, uh, uh, what do you call a little town here with uh, the restaurant in it? Kamak, yeah. Come back to Kamak, okay? Um, Come back, you know. You don't have to take everybody, Joshua. He said, just to let two or 3,000 guys go. There's no sense in sending everybody. Well, Joshua errs on the side of caution, and he sends 3,000 men up to Ai. And I'm not going to read the rest of the account, but it goes like this. They went up to Ai, and the men of Ai came out and chased them all the way back to their encampment. And in fact, there were Israelite men that died, soldiers that died. What would you do? If you had just won a great victory by God's hand at this huge city, this walled city of Jericho, and you said, hey, God is with us. This is great. God promised that he was going to fight for us. Look at how those walls fell down. We totally obliterated Jericho. And now you're getting chased back home by the little town of Ai. Soldiers, friends, dads, husbands died. What would you be doing when you went back to camp? What would you be doing when you reported to General Joshua and said, Joshua, we don't understand. What is God doing here? Oh, why couldn't we defeat Ai? We just defeated Jericho. And it wasn't even that Ai had some kind of crack troops or something like that where uh, they, they were some, some kind of super soldiers. They were just men defending their city. I imagine those guys from Ai, those soldiers, They're like, ha, Jericho couldn't defeat him, but we did. I bet there was a big party that night. I guarantee you there was. Joshua, verse 6, rent his clothes and fell to the earth upon his face before the ark of the Lord until the eventide. He and the elders of Israel put dust upon their heads, and Joshua said, Alas, O Lord God, wherefore hast thou at all brought this people over Jordan? to deliver us into the hand of the Amorites, to destroy us? Would to God that we had been content and dwelt on the other side, Jordan. O Lord, what shall I say when Israel turneth their backs before their enemies? God, what is the answer here? Why have we been defeated when you said we were going to have the victory? Why have we experienced this death and destruction when you said we were going to experience a new land? A land flowing with milk and honey and where we could raise our children and be a nation. What am I going to say to these people? Here's God's response. The Lord said unto Joshua in verse 10, Get thee up, wherefore liest thou thus upon thy face? Israel hath sinned. Verse 11, Israel hath sinned, and they have also transgressed my covenant, which I commanded them, for they have even taken of the accursed thing and have also stolen and dissembled also, and they have even, they have put it even among their own stuff. Therefore, the children of Israel could not stand before their enemies, but turned their backs before their enemies, because they were accursed. Neither will I be with you any more. Except ye destroy the accursed from among you, up, sanctify the people, and say, Sanctify yourselves against tomorrow. For thus saith the Lord God of Israel, There is an accursed thing in the midst of thee. O Israel, thou canst not stand before thine enemies until ye take away the accursed thing from among you. In the morning, therefore, ye shall be brought according to your tribes, and it shall be that the tribe which the Lord taketh shall come according to the families thereof, and the family which the Lord shall take shall come by households, and the household which the Lord shall uh, take shall come man by man. And it shall be that he that is taken with the accursed thing shall be burnt with fire, he and all that he hath, because he hath transgressed the covenant of the Lord, and because he hath wrought folly in Israel." This is the plan. This is what God said that was going to happen. Now, once again, we know verse 1. But Joshua does not know. And God communicates. This is one of the things that my mind, you know, thinks about, you know, when I'm trying to go to sleep at night or something like that. Why did God just not say, Joshua? 
Because God is talking to Joshua here, right? Okay. He says the whole plan, he gives it all to him. He says Israel's not going to be able to stand before their enemies because they've taken the accursed thing. He says this is what has happened. God does not tell Joshua that, hey, it's Achan too. Just go get him. Go arrest him. Go judge him. Why doesn't God do that? I believe God doesn't do that for a reason. God tells Joshua, we're going to go through a process here. A process that he announces to all the people. He says, hey, we're going to have a sanctified assembly tomorrow. We're going to bring you all together. And the reason why we lost to the soldiers at Ai, and the reason why there's 33 men that didn't come back, because somebody took of the accursed thing. Tomorrow we're going to take you by tribe. Tomorrow we're going to take you by family, and by household. And we're going to come man by man until God says, this is the one. This is the one that has brought such uh, sorrow and destruction upon Israel by sinning. What kind of night do you think Achan had that night? And they knew that they were coming together in the morning like that. Because in the morning you should be brought according to your tribes. It goes on and on. And the Bible says that's exactly what happened. The tribe of Judah was taken in verse 16. And then from the family of Judah he took the family of the Zarites. And the Zarites, the, the family of Zabdi, and man by man they took him until the household Verse 18, Achan was taken, the son of Carmi, the son of Zabdi, the son of Zerah, of the tribe of Judah was taken. And Joshua said unto Achan, My son, give, I pray thee, glory to the Lord God of Israel, and make confession unto him, and tell me now what thou hast done. Hide it not from me. This is what happens when we let the little things destroy us. This is what happens. We think that it's okay. We think that we're the only one that it doesn't apply to once again. We think that God's word um, doesn't mean me. God's word doesn't mean that it applies to my family or to what I'm doing. God's word has nothing to do with it. I'm just going to do my own thing. God says that's not what you're going to do. I've seen this in my life. I've seen it in other people's lives. These little things, these seemingly insignificant things that take place in our life that really it makes us powerless before God. The Israelites were not able to stand against their enemies. In fact, God said, I'm not going to be with you anymore. I'm not going to be with you unless you remove the accursed thing from your midst and you judge the sin that's going on. Folks, as I look at the world around us, there is forces at work that are definitely sinful. Sinful doesn't even begin to describe it. The world in which we live seems to have gotten a lot darker in the past year, the past two years. It's more out there. It's more in your face. It's more open. Such hatred and, and, and debauchery and things that are going on and twisted, perverted thinking. And the church will rise up against that and they'll denounce that and they'll say, why are people acting that way? That's going to bring America down. Look at how, well, how we're going. Look at what's happening in America. And I'm concerned about what's happening in America. I do know that there are sinister, evil things going on in the background with people that have huge amounts of control over this country, over this world. And I know that God's plan is being worked out. And I'm concerned about that. And I, I watch the same news articles and, and things that you do. I see these things and I get concerned about them. These are huge things that are going on. But I'll tell you this. I think more than any of those type of things right now, we need to be concerned about the little things. In my heart, the things that seem insignificant in your life that you allow to be there, the sin that is going to render you powerless, 
The sin that the Bible says will separate between you and your God. Now, we live in the dispensation of grace, folks, and I am so thankful for that. Achan did not live in the dispensation of grace. He lived under the dispensation of law. And under the law, if you transgress the law, you paid the price for that. In the dispensation of grace, Jesus Christ has already paid the penalty for our sin. Amen? If you're here today and you don't know Jesus Christ as your own personal Savior, let me tell you something. Your sins have already been paid for at the cross. And Jesus Christ, the Bible says, offers you the free gift of eternal life through his payment, what he did for you on the cross. And if you don't accept that payment for your sin, you don't receive it and graciously receive and humbly receive the gift of eternal life that Jesus Christ has paid for you, then you will pay for your sins for all eternity in lake of fire. That's the Bible. If you don't accept Jesus Christ's gift of eternal life, if you don't accept Jesus Christ's righteousness imputed to your account, you cannot enter into heaven. And if you're here this morning and you don't know him as your Savior, you've never repented of your sins. You've never seen your sin as God sees sin. You've never asked him to forgive you. You've never by faith received Jesus as your Savior. Then the Bible says, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. It doesn't say might be. It doesn't say hope to be. It says you will be saved. But for Christians who have received Jesus as their Savior, and we live in this dispensation of grace, our sins, yes, are under the blood of Jesus Christ. But I'm telling you right now, the Bible says, whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. You will experience the wrath and the, and the displeasure of God in your life. As he seeks to discipline his child and bring him closer into fellowship with him. It's not the relationship that is severed under this dispensation of grace. Once you're saved, folks, if you truly trusted Christ, you are saved. I know some of our Armenian brethren have a problem with that a little bit. But the relationship is established. You have become a Christian. And the Bible says nothing can separate you from the love of God at that point. However, the fellowship, the close relationship with Jesus Christ is what suffers. And it's the little things that will destroy that relationship. If you're married here today, I mentioned we have two newly minted Married couples here this morning. I won't point them out, but some of you know who they are, and, and uh, we're glad they're here today. But if you've been married for any amount of time, I think I saw somebody had just celebrated a particular anniversary. Uh, now I'm going to get myself in trouble because I'm thinking about it. But anyways, happy anniversary to you if you are. <clears throat> I've seen several. You know as well as I do that if you don't, you don't take care of the details in that married life and that married relationship, oh yeah, you might be able to go a few days. You might be able to go some weeks. Hey, you might even make it a month before things get really nasty at home, but they're going to get nasty. They're going to get difficult. That relationship has got to be maintained daily. And so does our relationship with Jesus Christ, folks, or it will destroy us. It will destroy the relationship that we have with Jesus Christ, I guarantee you. I've seen it time and time and time again in my life, in the life of other people. This is what's going on with Achan here. This is what's going on with the people of Israel. It's the little things that will destroy you. And I want you to see three things here this morning that I believe contribute to this catastrophic failure in our life here. What happens here? First of all, I want you to see the cause of catastrophic sin. The cause of catastrophic sin. You know, even though Achan was the only one that stole something, the Bible says that the whole, um, the whole people of Israel, the whole nation, suffered because of Achan's sin. And how was Joshua supposed to know, right? I mean, uh, your kids pull the wool over your eyes every day, right? I know my kids did. I know we did as kids. Later on, when we sit around the Christmas tree, 
um, and tell stories about our childhood with mom and dad there. Now, mom's been gone now, but we used to tell the stories, and they just shake their heads saying, we don't want to know anymore. You know, and, and, you know, as adult children, you think, hey, they might like to know this. They don't want to know that, you guys, okay? They really don't, all right? They feel like they're a failure already enough, uh, you know, don't tell them anymore. Um, uh, that was my bad, but what are the causes here of the catastrophic sin that Achan did, and, and it, it really came to fruition in the life of Israel here? First of all, I want you to see there was a rationalization of sin, a rationalization of sin, the Bible says here in verse 20, And Achan answered Joshua and said, Indeed, I have sinned. He admits it. He confessed it. Indeed, I have sinned against, against the Lord God of Israel, and thus and thus have I done. He told him the story. When I saw among the spoils a goodly Babylonian garment and 200 shekels of silver and a wedge of gold of 50 shekels weight, and even names of sin, then I coveted them. And took them. And behold, they are hid in the earth in the midst of my tent and the silver under it. What's Achan doing here? Achan is doing the same thing as all the other soldiers are. The walls fall down of Jericho and they rush the, the city of Jericho. Of course, all the men of battle, they weren't ready for those walls to fall down. The, Jer the soldiers in Jericho there, they were all up on those uh, on those walls and in their fighting positions, I'm sure. They're watching these crazy Israelites walk around one day and walk around another day and on for six days on the seventh day. They're like, man, they're, they're not leaving today. They're walking around it seven times and on the seventh time, all those walls fall down. Imagine it took out a lot of their soldiers at that point. The Israelites rush over the rubble and they take the city. And of course, there's gonna be spoils of war there. And Achan rationalizes his sin. He says, look at there. There's a nice suit of clothes, a Babylonian garment. I'm not for sure what that looked like, but I'm sure it was the hottest thing. The coolest thing. Brush off some of the rubble, put it through the dry cleaners there in the camp, and you'll be fine. Okay. What, what's God going to do with a garment? I mean, I need a new change of clothes. We're coming to a new land. We're going to have to dress a little bit more respectable. We've been wandering in the wilderness for 40 years. Look at these tattered clothes I got on. And here goes Achan. He, he sees this Babylonian garment. And then he digs a little bit more. 200 shekels of silver. Folks, he is a rich man. A wedge of gold. What's it say? 50 shekels weight there? Wow. I mean, this guy is now rich. He starts to rationalize. What, what would it be like to just take that? It would be fine. There's nothing wrong with that. I know what God said, but I know better. And what we do is we rationalize or we excuse our sin as not as bad as somebody else's sin or we talk ourselves into sin. It's just a little sin. I mean, he looks around, no one's looking and things, and, and he says, God can't use this garment. God doesn't, isn't going to miss this silver and this piece of gold. I need it more than God needs it. We rationalize sin. That's one of the causes of catastrophic sin. I wonder, I wonder how we've rationalized sin this past week. I wonder how we've said, hey, it's okay. I mean, nobody's going to know, right? Because not only does, is there rationalization of sin going on, but there's a revelation of selfishness. You know who he's thinking about? He's only thinking about himself. He's not thinking at this point about the Israelite men who are going to die, who go to Ai to try to defeat that little town. He's not thinking about his wife and kids that are going to suffer the consequences of his sin here. He's not thinking about anything or anybody else right now other than himself. And that's the selfishness of sin that causes such a catastrophe in our life. If Satan can start getting me to think less about God's word, if Satan can start getting me to think more about myself and what my needs are, more about pleasing me than pleasing God, if Satan can get my mind off of God's word and off of God's commandments, then he has won the battle in my life of selfishness. 
Because we don't need much of a push, folks, to become more and more selfish. We are innately selfish. That's exactly what took place in Achan's life. And I also want you to see the other cause of the catastrophic sin was that it could remain a secret. He says, look, I had a whole plan here. I've coveted them and took them, and behold, they're hidden the earth in the midst of my tent and the silver under it. So Joshua sent messengers, and they ran into the tent, and behold, it was hid in his tent and the silver under it. And they took them out of the midst of the tent and brought them unto Joshua. Here's the evidence. And all the children of Israel and laid them out before the Lord. Oh, yep, there it is. Not only do we have a confession from Achan, but we also have the proof. The proof of his sin here, and he thought that he was going to get away with it. He thought that he could hide his sin. And folks, I want to ask you a, a question that only you can answer in the, in the deep recesses of your own heart. What would you do if you knew no one would ever find out about it? What would you do if you knew nobody would ever find out about it? What would you be willing to do? Just because of selfishness. Just because of an excuse or rationalization of sin. What have we done? Because we said, hey, I can get away with this. Nobody will ever find out about it. The Holy Spirit brings conviction to the believer's life. He says, you've done that. Thought nobody would ever know. The Bible says in the book of Numbers, and be sure your sin will find you out. Be sure your sin will find you out. Some of the most haunting words in all of Scripture. Be sure your sin will find you out. This is the cause of catastrophic sin in our life, folks. But I also want you to see the certainties of catastrophic sin as well. The certainties of catastrophic sin. What is going to take place what took place in Achan's life here because of this? First of all, I see it's going to bring defeat. It's going to bring defeat. Joshua, verse 24, and all Israel with him, took Achan, the son of Zerah, and the silver, and the garment, and the wedge of gold, and his sons, and his daughters, and his oxen, and his asses, and his sheep, and his tent, and all that he had, and they brought them unto the valley of Achor. And Joshua said, why hast thou troubled us? The Lord shall trouble thee this day. Why have you done this, Achan? Why did you rationalize and excuse your sin? Why did you think that nobody would ever know? God is all-knowing. God sees everything. And yes, God may let you get away with something for now, and there may be something in your past that you think you've gotten away with for years, maybe decades. Sometimes, yeah, it never comes to light. And go to your grave with that secret. But I know this. It's the little things. The little things that we think no one knows, no one cares about. That'll destroy us and make us powerless. It'll give us defeat. Defeat along with disheartening and discouragement of the, of the soldiers and of Israel. Joshua says, why have you troubled us? Why have you brought this kind of defeat upon us? And I'm telling you this, that if we allow the little sins to continue on in our lives, we allow the little things we, which we think of, are of no import. It's not anything big, Pastor Roy. It's not like I'm stealing from a store or it's not like I'm selling drugs on the corner. You know, it's not like I'm, you know, killing people or robbing or breaking into homes and stealing nice cars. Not doing any of that kind of stuff. I'm a good person. Yeah, I might let this slide in my life. I might let this go. Well, what does God say about it? God doesn't think of it as little It's a breaking of God's command. Disobedience. It brought defeat. It brought displeasure. 
The Bible says that God told Joshua, I'm not going to be with you anymore. If you don't deal with this sin, I'm not going to, I'm not going to bless you. I'm not going to be with you. You're not going to win any more victories. You've got to deal with sin, Joshua. And sin always has to be dealt with in my heart first. Eventually it comes out. And it gets worse, and it gets worse, and it gets worse. Until it will come out, and it will cause problems. It will bring God's displeasure in your life. It will do things to your marriage. It will do things to your children. It will do things to your employment. It will get worse and worse and worse. And also brought destruction. The Bible says that because he had troubled Israel, Israel was going to trouble them. And all Israel stoned them with stones and burned them with fire after they had stoned them with stones. And they raised over him a great heap of stones unto this day. So the Lord turned from the fierceness of his anger, wherefore the name of that place was called the Valley of Achor unto this day. The Bible says that they took his family. Different commentators say different things, but I believe that they took his family and everything that he owned, and they obliterated his family from Israel. Stone with stones, they all died. Ruined everything that he had worked for just because he wanted something that he couldn't have. Something that God said, don't do. Don't do this. If he just would have waited. Folks, there are so many basic Bible principles that are being violated here, and yet we violate them every single day. Where God says, this isn't good for you, this will be harmful for you. Or God says, absolutely not, you should not do this. Or God says, hey, I'll give it to you, but why don't you wait a little bit? Why don't you wait? If Achan just would have waited, how, what would have his life been like? So say Achan came into Jericho and he saw that stuff and he said, oh, that's God's. And he just went with what God's word said. It's pretty easy to do. Oh, that's God's. Everybody else did. No, Achan says, I got to have it now. But what if he said, no, I'm not going to do that. They destroy Jericho and they go on to Ai. They defeat Ai, and he finds something even better there in Ai. You know what? There's less soldiers up there at Ai. More moolah to go around. More spoil. Yeah, it was a smaller town, but hey, they, they didn't have to split it so many ways. And they would have just went on victory after victory after victory. And Achan would have had his family. Achan's name would have been still in... Judah's lineage. Now it was nothing. Certainties that happen with catastrophic sin. Now I want you to see thirdly, the challenges of catastrophic sin. The challenges of catastrophic sin. I see first of all, because this is what happens when I say challenges here. When, when anything bad happens, like the Space Shutter Challenger or, or um, you know, an airplane goes down, or I'm going to be talking about that in just a second, or, or things of that nature, people all, there's people that are, you know, in the government that that's their job. They come in, they try to figure out what went wrong. Why did this happen? NASA had their engineers when the Space Shuttle Challenger blew up, and then we have the NTSB, the National Tra uh, Transportation Safety Board, and things like that. They always go in. You always see those guys coming in on airplane disasters and things. I'm like, what happened here? What went wrong? Why did all these people have to die? We need to find out so it doesn't happen again. Well, these are the challenges of catastrophic sin. First of all, it proves retribution. It proves retribution. You know what happens here, folks? It proves that you can't get away with your sin. It proves that God knows. It proves that because we perform an action, there's another action that is also performed. That God sees it, that there will be judgment. 
that you cannot go on living in sin. You cannot go on uh, hiding your sin. You cannot go on doing the things that you think that nobody else knows about because eventually it will come out. And you will get caught. Like I said, we're seeing uh, the de de uh, degradation of society as a whole. And we see it plastered on our television sets every night and all during the day and things. And it's all people talk about. And man, we get really concerned about it. But folks, it's time that we get concerned about us. It's time that, that we get concerned about the sin that I allow in my life. The little things that slide by and we say, oh, nobody will know. God will judge it. God will judge it. Whenever you have disasters, even like this disaster that happened in Beirut the other day, that was an explosion, folks. But why are they keeping 2,700 tons of ammonium nitrate in the middle of the city? Something bad was going to happen eventually. And you know what they're doing now? They're investigating it, and people's heads will probably literally roll. Okay. Because eventually, something happens. We think we're real clever. We think we're real smart. We think that we're smarter than God. We think we're smarter than our spouse. We think that we're smarter than, uh, you know, the, the boss at work. Or you, you kids think you're smarter than your parents and things like that. We're not. We're not. Sin has a way of divulging itself. And there will be judgment. There will be retribution. There's always some kind of payment. Another challenge. It promotes righteousness. I guarantee you this, folks, that Achan's sin was a reminder to every Israelite that whenever they went into a city again or whenever God said, do this or don't do that, they're going to remember Achan. Because you know why it says here, they raise this great heap of stones over them until this day. Well, you know what that was? It was a reminder that this is what happens when you go against God's word. This is what happens when you think you can sin and get away with it. This is what happens when we go against an explicit command of God's word. It promotes righteousness. We should look and we should say, hey, I better get right with God. I better start shaping up here. I better start looking into God's word and saying, this is what God's word says and this is what I'm going to do. It's really simple. It's hard because we have a sin nature. It's hard because we think we're more clever than God, that we know more than God. Achan thought that he knew more. But when we start looking into God's word and it says do this or don't do this, then that's what we ought to do and, or don't do. It should promote righteousness. And thirdly, it provides reassurance. You know what happens now in verse 1 of chapter 8? And the Lord said unto Joshua, fear not. Neither be thou dismayed. Take all the people of war with thee and arise. Go up to Ai. See, I have given into thy hand the king of Ai and his people and his city and his land. Here's the reassurance. The reassurance that God says, I'm going to be with you. You dealt with sin. You didn't let it slide. You didn't try to cover it up. And now I'm going to bless you. There is this reassurance that he gives to Joshua once again that he had given to him in chapter 1 and, and they believed God and they took on Jericho in that faith and in that reassurance that God was going to provide that God was going to give them the victory and now they dealt with the sin and he says to Joshua go up to Ai I've given it into your hand what changed? what changed? they did what God told them to do they did what God told them to do and he provided reassurance to them that once sin is dealt with in my life, then God's hand is going to be with me again. And I don't have to worry about that. Back in October of 2018, some of you remember this, an Indonesian flight called Lion Air took off in a Boeing 737. A Boeing 737 MAX. Maybe you've heard that in the news. That Boeing 737 took off and about 13 minutes later, it was in the ocean north of Indonesia there. 
People from an oil well offshore there and other eyewitnesses said that that plane went in at full throttle with the engines going in a steep nose dive and was obliterated upon contact with the ocean. 189 people died that day as a result of that airplane crash just north of Indonesia. Once again, the experts come in and they try to piece together what was done and what, what happened here. Was it pilot error? Was it a malfunction of some kind or something like that? To the best that they could piece together, there's a little sensor called an angle of attack sensor. Now I'm talking over my pay grade here. I can read the same as you guys can read, but I studied this a little bit and we got some pilots in here, but it's a little sensor, angle of attack. And, and what I read about this said that a malfunction of the angle of attack sensor could lead to this maneuvering characteristics augmentation system, which I assume is software, to believe that the aircraft is stalling when it isn't, causing it to dip the aircraft's nose to recover from a non-existent stall, even in level flight. So this angle of attack sensor which they didn't have redundancies for, and there was other problems with this, and the software comes into play here as well. It's a little bit complicated, I think, but to sum it up is, here's this little sensor that wasn't calibrated correctly, that wasn't, didn't have a redundancy to it, and, and if it would have been correct, it would have made the software think that it was in a stall and try to get some more air underneath those wings by going into a nosedive, no. The pilots totally lost control of this. Uh, the little black box, what they call that aircraft recorder, um, signified that the pilots really began to look through their checklists of non, um, non-important things, not non-important things, but non-things uh, that don't normally happen. They were going through those type of things, and they got really panicked at the end, of course, of, I would have too. And they ended up with the plane just going on a nosedive into the ocean. Ethiopian Airlines 737 MAX. Later on, in March of 2019, with 157 people on board, same thing. And now, if you go somewhere, you might see these 737 Maxes parked. If you get into an airplane right now, and the little card in front of you says 737 Max, get off that airplane. No, they've got them parked right now. They're trying to figure out, Boeing's trying to figure out what's going on. Folks, it was just a little sensor. It was just a little sensor. It was malfunctioning. It wasn't calibrated quite correctly. I wonder, I wonder if, if something in my life, if something in your life is malfunctioning today. Malfunctioning, a, a, a nice big word for sin that is not going correctly. It's not calibrated correctly. Our heart is not in tune with God's word to the point where we believe it and we live it. And we say that no matter what, the world is doing around me, no matter what my friends are doing, no matter what uh, society says is okay to do, I'm not going to do it because God's word says it's sin. Sin. Therefore, I'm going to trust God's word. I'm going to obey God's word. We calibrate our life to the word of God. And we don't try to calibrate the word of God to my life. That's how Christians sometimes try to live. Well, God, when your word lines up with me, then we'll be, we'll be in agreement. No, my life has to be in agreement with God's word. And if my life is not in agreement with God's word, then I've got a malfunction, and it's the little things that'll destroy us. With heads bowed and eyes closed and no one looking around here this morning, I wonder if there's anybody in here, first of all, that would say, Pastor Rory, I don't know that... If I were to die right now, I'd go to heaven. I don't know. I've never trusted Jesus Christ as my personal Savior. I've never asked him to forgive me for my sins. And I realize that if I don't, it will destroy me. And I need to trust Jesus. Would you pray for me? Is there anybody in here today that would just simply raise your hand and allow me to pray for you? Anybody at all? Pastor Roy, I don't know where I'd spend eternity if I were to die right now. That concerns me. Anybody like that today at all? Across the auditorium? How about Christians this morning? This is a very pointed message, I know. We don't like to talk about the secret sin in our life. 
We don't like to talk about the fact that we might be malfunctioning right now in our marriage, in our home, in our Christian life, in our Christian walk. We're not walking close to the Lord. We've allowed the little things to slip in there and to cause trouble, to cause problems, to cause defeat where we should be experiencing victory. And you as a Christian would say, Pastor Roy, pray for me. Something from God's word has spoken to my heart. Would you pray for me? Thank you for that hand and that hand and those hands. Thank you for that one. Anybody else? Thank you for that hand. Anybody else? Pastor Roy, pray for me. Thank you for that hand. Anybody else? Pastor Roy, pray for me. I, I've got to get this taken care of. Thank you for that hand. Anybody else? Pastor Roy, pray for me. I don't want the destruction that comes with the little things. The things that I think are hidden, the things that I think aren't going to be of much importance at all. But they are. And that's me, Pastor Ray. Can I see your hand? Anybody else? In just a second, we're going to have our time of invitation. And folks, if there's an issue, if there's a problem, if there's something that we can help you with today, why don't you come? Father in heaven, I thank you for the time together. Lord, I pray that you would be with us during this time of invitation. May you speak to hearts and bring challenge and conviction, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's all stand to our feet. We're going to sing the song, My Jesus, I Love Thee. You come as we sing. <laughs> instruments continue to play we're here in the auditorium there may be some watching us on live stream today if you are I know you can't come forward but man get alone with God there in your house spend some time with him in private if you're here and you need some scriptural advice you need prayer you need something somebody to take you aside a little bit why don't you come for the Holy Spirit and the challenge and conviction that he brings to each heart. You told us that the Holy Spirit would bring conviction. You told us that he would convict of righteousness, of sin, of judgment. Lord, I pray that as we allow the Holy Spirit to work in our lives today, that we would be a people that, is, that are righteous. We'd be a people that want to live by the book, by the word of God. We would be a people that would be holy, without blemish, striving to please you more than striving to please ourselves or the world around us. Lord, there's a lot of different things going on in our world. A lot of sin, a lot of wickedness. That's the big things. But Lord, may we be more concerned about the little things today. May we be very introspective. May we root out any hidden sin or any sin that doesn't belong in our life right now that we think we're getting away with and confess it and forsake it. Find mercy. Lord, I pray that you'd be with each one that's making decisions today. Father, I pray that that would be a decision that would change their life beginning right now. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, thank you for being here this morning. It's a great crowd for still kind of being the summer. I know school started a little bit, places, different things. Um, and you got to be here because you can't be on vacation now. Um, but um, thank you for being here. I hope you come back tonight at 6 o'clock for our school night and uh, be a part of that service. I know it will be encouragement to our teachers and to our students and parents as well. If you're visiting with us, don't forget to stop by in the lobby and let me greet you and get to know you a little bit better here today as well. All right. I don't believe I have any other announcements, Pastor Warren. 
I know of. If you're wanting to start in choir, now's the time to get back at it. I, there was a great crowd up there uh, last week. It really encouraged my heart. And I know some of you can sing. I know some of you can't, okay? It's just not your gift. And so, um, you know, you can serve in other ways, okay? But um, if you can sing, man, we'd love to have you, all right? Be a great encouragement to the choir, to Pastor Halleck, and later on even to um, the people that I know we bless, like the Red, White, and Blue Day and the Living Christmas Tree Ministry that's coming up, all right? So, um, once again, thank you for being here. We've had our prayer. Pastor Halleck has our final song, and we'll be dismissed. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. coming. Look forward to seeing you back again tonight.